Carlotta Mercedes McCambridge was an American actress of radio, stage, and film, and also television. Now, that may be a name that you're not that familiar with, but she was a powerhouse in the 50s. Orson Welles actually called her the greatest living radio actress that there was. She won Academy Awards for Best Supporting Actress, and she was also nominated for other roles, too. She was born in Joliet, Illinois, and her parents farmed in that area. After she graduated, she went on to college in Chicago before she embarked on her acting career. In radio, she began her acting career during the 1930s while also performing on Broadway. In 1941, she played Judy's girlfriend in A Date with Judy. She played the role of a defense attorney in a crime drama broadcast on ABC from 1951 to 1952. She was in just a plethora of radio shows. She was in Lights Out, Inner Sanctum, Gangbusters, Murder at Midnight, Ford Theater, Alfred Hitchcock, and the list goes on and on in the radio area. She did real frequent roles on CBS's Radio Mystery Theater, and she was an original cast member of Guiding Light. From 1953 to 1954, she starred in a soap opera called Family Skeleton that was on CBS. Now, on television, she played Catherine Wells in Wire Service, a drama series that aired on ABC during the 1956-57 season. And that was produced by Desilu Productions. The story is about a group of reporters that work for a fictional trans-global wire service. In the season one episode of the original Lost in Space series, The Space Croppers, in 1966, she played a character named Sibylla, the matriarch of a family of supernatural space farmers. Then there was the episode of Bewitched that was entitled Darren Gone and Forgotten, which aired on ABC in October of 1968. She played a powerful witch named Carlotta. Now remember, that is her real name, her given name. And she's a frenemy of Endora. Endora and Carlotta had made a pact at the turn of the century that their firstborn children would one day marry. When according to the terms of the pact, certain celestial things happened, it was time for the marriage, and Carlotta disappeared Darren and pushed for Samantha to marry her coddled son, Juke, played by veteran character actor Steve Franken. Now, her film career just took off like crazy when she was cast as Sadie Burke opposite Broderick Crawford in All the King's Men. This was in 1949, and it was loosely based on Huey P. Long of Louisiana, and the powerhouse that he ran in that state. She won the 1949 Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for her role, while the film won Best Picture for that year. She also won the Golden Globe Award for Best Supporting Actress and New Star of the Year Actress for her performances. In 1954, she played in an offbeat Western drama called Johnny Guitar, and she co-starred with Joan Crawford and Sterling Hayden. Both Cambridge and Hayden publicly declared their dislike for Crawford. They actually labeled her as a mean, tipsy, powerful, and rotten egg lady. Then in 1956, she played the supporting role of Luz in George Stevens' classic Giant, which starred Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson, and James Dean. She was nominated for another Academy Award as Best Supporting Actress, but she lost that year to Dorothy Malone in Written on the Wind. In the year 1959, she appeared opposite Katharine Hepburn, Montgomery Cliff, and Elizabeth Taylor again in the film adaption of Tennessee Williams' Suddenly Last Summer but one of the roles that she stands out in the most, you never see her face 
on the screen. You just hear her voice. And it was an uncredited role until she raised a stink about it and eventually got credited for the role. But she played the demon voice in The Exorcist. Now that voice is not just a voice. It's a character. The sounds that seep out of that 12-year-old's throat, which was Linda Blair, are not of this world. They are pained and guttural and raw like an open wound. It's a voice that is full of ancient rage and disarming dry wit. Ultimately, it isn't really fair to say that her contribution to The Exorcist was merely vocal. Her performance made the demon an entity, something evil and angry that clawed its way out of hell straight into the little girl's body. Now, the details on how she actually did it are pretty interesting. She put herself through hell to achieve this performance. She actually broke her sobriety because she asked to be drunk on the set, and she had had a problem drinking and had been sober for a number of years. She actually requested that there be a priest there to help her get back sober again after she finished the project. She gargled raw eggs. She chain smoked to make her bronchial voice wheezy and gurgly. They actually restrained her during the sessions because they wanted her to feel the boundness that the little girl felt. She felt like that type of performance was only possible when you had no freedom at all. She made her career out of playing tough women which would come as no surprise given her unparalleled ability to stare her own demons square in the face. Because she was problematic where alcohol was concerned, it had ruled her life and almost ruined her career. She was often hospitalized for her bouts of heavy drinking. And she finally made it to Alcoholics Anonymous and went there numerous times before she actually achieved her sobriety. She spent the bulk of her remaining life trying to help other alcoholics achieve sobriety, but she endured one of the biggest setbacks that anybody could possibly endure in the 1980s. She had a son that was named John Markle, and he was a graduate with a PhD in economics and he joined an investment firm called Stevens Incorporated, located in Little Rock, Arkansas. He worked there and was a futures trader, and he quickly rose through the company ranks. But in the fall of 1987, the company discovered that Markle had opened a secret account in his mother's name. Soon the company found out that Markle had been commingling the funds and charging losses to the Stevens House account while creating all revenue from winning trades to his mother's account. Her son Markle was shown to later have forged his mother's signature in actually opening the account. Once the company found out about all this misdoing, they put him on medical leave. Then they fired him from his position for mishandling funds. He tried to get his mother to help him repay the company to avoid being prosecuted, but she refused. Shortly thereafter, in November of 1987, Mr. Markle killed his entire family, his wife Christine, his daughter Amy, who was 13, and Suzanne, his other daughter, who was age 9, and then he killed himself. He left both a note taking responsibility for his crimes and he left a long, bitter letter to his mother. He told her that you were never around much when I needed you, so now I and my whole family are dead. So you can have the money. Night, mother. It's actually such a sad story to think that all these people lost their lives over money, and she lost her family in the blink of an eye. Mercedes Cambridge died alone, March 2, 2004, in La Jolla in San Diego County, California, of natural causes. It was two weeks before her 88th birthday. 
Thank you for the great roles that you played, Mercedes, and the help that you gave other people as they struggled with alcoholism. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.